load. Oh, snack. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. All right. Stabilize. Stabilize. Are we and flying or did we explode? We're back and speak of the devil. We have landing inhibit in purple lit up on the screen. How well, it shouldn't say that. <laughs> how apropos was that question? So there is a a bug. So a state load brought the landing inhibit. Now, granted, when I did the state load, the plane did quite a bronco ride through the sky before it stabilized. So maybe that's why it thought we were landing and it put put the landing inhibit on. But isn't that timely, that question? Oh, definitely. Um, I've seen this before when uh, I think it was Josh or you who reloaded. No, you're, you're the one who reloaded. And there was the landing inhibitor message still there uh, on reload. And it's even, I can see X-Plane even reload there, that piece of desert in the med middle of I Germany. Think, That's lovely. I think it's a uh, military field blocked out. But that'd be too big of a military field. Might be a testing range. Yeah, could be. Let's ignore it. I have to fix that. Nearchem. We'll call that the Nearchem distortion. <laughs> sure. Tim Rodeo, coffee maker malfunction is a, damn, a downright emergency. Like land ASAP. Yeah. All right, I'm going to turn off one of my data outputs. I'm going to get rid of the weather one. I'm going to leave frames up here. We are having a bit of a frame hit right now, but I don't think it's doing that drop, drop, drop. Let's see what's happened. Let's let it, let's let it think for a moment. Let's look down here. There's 30 frames. And sure enough, it is not dropping to 15. So there you go. Public beta 5 for the win. And for Steve's Steve's a twenty, uh, he was asking about toga lock after takeoff. Um, toga lock usually happens if you rotate really, really quickly and very high. The airplane will hit. Uh, initially, you need to rotate. You need to rotate at a reasonable pace because otherwise, you're going to have you put an excessive angle of attack on the AOA sensor, and that might make the plane go into alpha floor protection and then immediately into toga lock because it's basically things like oh my god we are about to stall so you need to be a little bit uh, softer on your rotation normally you would reach about 10 degrees nose up after about three to four second seconds of rotation and the airplane will lift off on its own at about seven degrees nose up and then if you continue the smooth rotation you should be you should reach after maybe Eight to ten seconds, you should reach about 15 degrees nose up, and that's roughly where you're aiming for for the initial rotation. That way, you will avoid toga lock. As you remember, John, you've had that same problem initially when you flew the uh, 320. Mm -hmm. If you rotate it too quickly and it hit alpha floor, and then immediately went to toga lock. Mm -hmm. And as for top of descent, uh, uh, the Airbus, unlike a Boeing, will not uh, initiate descent on its own. So there's, it isn't sufficient if you just wind a lower value into the altitude window on the glare shield there. You also need to push the button to manually engage the descent, manage descent mode, or open Which descent. Which is but crazy that they don't... Okay, so that, that brings me to my next question. It, the fact that it doesn't do it automatically, some people could say that's a good thing, some would say it's, eh, it's not good. Is there a visual indication that you've hit your top of descent? that's really is, prominently displayed rather than in the McDo. Um, normally it will, so on the ND you will have your top of the center arrow, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that is your primary indication. You will have it on the magenta line, or rather on the green line on Air, Airbus, and there will be a little arrow that's sort of pointing off to the side and then pointing a little bit down at a 45 degree angle. That's your top of descent indicator. That's the same I as think it should be an ECAM message. T slash D. There's a second message where it will tell you decelerate when mm. you're nearing the top of descent. Uh, it'll flash that up on the PFD. I have seen that. Yeah. So yeah, it, it'll tell you also in that way. But there is, I'm as far as I'm aware, there's no like flashing blinking light or something on an Airbus. I don't know why Airbus designed it like this, but this is the way it works. Um,
Uh, let's see, Franz008 asking about... He asked uh, the pilot if we should not be able to flex to N1 power down at 80% because I can't achieve that with the FF320. The M1 always sits between 87 and 91. Um... I'm not really sure. I don't have the performance tables for the uh, CFM engines on this thing, so I can't tell you exactly what flex value should, uh, re which should represent a specific N1 value. Can't really tell you that, so I don't know. Um, there's a bunch of other questions down here. Yeah, the landing inhibit message should normally disappear. This is apparently a state reload bug and should be weeded out at some point. Uh, I wonder if that one's been submitted. Um, I don't know. Uh, I didn't submit it yet. Uh, DMBird48, the airplane will come with a quick intro guide. I mean, it already does. There might be somewhat more extensive documentation that will need to be written. Uh... But uh, the recommendation right now, if you really want to learn how to fly the Airbus, is you look at the uh, real uh, Airbus training materials that are out there. Uh, if you Google around, you'll find them. There's a bunch of them out over on Smart Cockpit. There's a bunch of manuals over on 737.org.uk. Uh, and of course, uh, you can find, if you really want to, uh, in fact, I can link, it's on YouTube, um, I'm not gonna, I don't know if the people who put it up had the rights to it, probably not, but there is a, uh, the whole Oxford Aviation Academy, uh, CBT, the computer-based training course for the A320 type rating up on YouTube. Mm. Um, get it while it's there, guys, because uh, this is normally not available stuff, so I don't think it has been put up there in quite the right legal context. But if you really, really want to know... Uh, if you Google around, you will find the relevant information. So here's the uh, full spiel on the A320 CBT course. Now this uh, information normally, this computer-based training course, normally if you get it from Oxford Aviation, will easily run you several hundred dollars. So. This is the th This is the one I'm thinking about getting. This is a A320 pilot handbook, color, wire out lay flat version. This thing apparently is pretty cool, but unfortunately it's $90. That's cheap. For training material, this is extremely cheap. Well, this is and this is tailored towards simulation as well, but it's also check ride oh. material. Oh, isn't that the same thing that JSnap had, or is this something else? It might, it might be the same thing that he has. Yeah. He had something like this, like written. Yeah, Mike Ray, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one. I think and that's the document that JSnap was working from. Um, it's uh, that's not really a training course uh, book. That's more of a flight simulation thing, sort of written in sort of enthusi enthusiast sort of down to earth way. So that it does, there's not like tons of theory. Uh, the computer-based training material that I linked is the stuff that Oxford Aviation do actually use when they uh, when you're doing the A320 type rating. Which is funny that they show like a. I don't know what plane they're showing on that first video. It's well, got that's like a an engineer panel. Picture on of it. seven two seven. That's a seven four seven. That's oh, a okay. seven four seven. And, okay. I think, but okay. that one. Or 707, and that is, uh, it's probably a 707, and that is just a sort of initial intro. If you click on any of the other videos there, you will see tons and tons of diagrams and tons and tons of boring stuff. So you click if, uh, if you want to show any of these, the any of the other videos is actually talking about the, the airplane. This was the initial picture there, it was just to sh sort of show the comparison of how automated and reduced the controls of the A320 are compared to, like, legacy airliners. Mm. All right, we are 
42 miles from top of descent into Berlin. And I'm really happy that reverting back to public beta 5 actually worked and the safe state worked. Except, cool. for, the, except for the landing inhib inhibit, but that's okay. We're not worried about And coffee. no more jitters. Nope, no more jitters. We do have ortho <laughs> issues, but... HD Hunter says that we're overthinking this. All we needed is the Peters aircraft A320. That's all we need to know. Sure. Yeah, he's got an electronic version. Mike Ray does. Yeah, it's cheaper, but I kind of wanted that spiral bound version. It is older, you like that? but it still would be kind of fun to. Oh, the watch. A320 hasn't undergone many changes. Yeah. Well, except for the NEOs, of course. But talking about the CEOs, the, the current, the current engine option ones, uh, those have not changed significantly in 10 years or, not, or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, it's a kind of it's, for, it's dependent. So working from what I saw about that book, uh, where Jason Nat was basically just going through the pages there, I saw that it was kind of a down-to-earth book. Like it, it wasn't trying to sugarcoat. Uh, use use a lot of jargon. Use a lot of like theoretical terms. It was sort of a really nice approach to this is important. This is what you got to pay attention to. This is what your instructor is going to try and, and catch you out on. Stuff like that. Mm. And it sort of sort of went uh, by flight phase, so that's really nice. Um, I can drop in here the A320 FMGS manual that's up on 737. Uh, if I can find it, there we go. It's 737ng.co.uk, and uh, this will basically give you a full uh, summary of what's in the FMGS, uh, in the Flight Factor 320. Now there's a couple of features in there in the real FMGS that uh, the FF320 currently doesn't have, but ultimately before the uh, 1.0 release hits, we pretty much want to approximate that particular manual down to, to all practical measures to be essentially the same thing. Uh, I don't know which Steve Z. I don't know which column you mean. Um, I'm sorry. BTU. John Fly, you're reading. I'm reading. I'm doing looking at something on my uh, on my bot. What, what's going on? No, it's just you sounded like you're completely frozen on the video. You're not moving, so. I was trying to think if you've just had a minor brain reboot. No, I was trying to figure out why my steels aren't working. <laughs> which is probably a good thing. Can I show the McDo? You bet. Uh, yeah, he's asking about some column there. On which page, Steve Z? That would be helpful because there's a lot of pages on the MCDU, which... Oh, it's UTC, not BTU. That's uh, current UTC time. I think. No, it's. Uh, hang on. Or maybe it's the um, next waypoint UTC time. It's one of those. I keep forgetting which one. Uh, the FMGS allows you to do like various uh, kinds of uh, planning. You can plan to cross a waypoint at a specific time, in which case the airplane will try to speed up or slow down to meet that time constraint. That's why in many places in the MCDU you'll find UTC lines where you can enter a value. Uh, you're thinking about the approach to do into Schoenfeld, right? Yeah, I'm going to start I, an open descent right now. ILS 26, right. Let's see about that. You want to do an auto land or you want to do it by hand like a real man? I want to disconnect the autopilot about a mile or two out. Okay, let's see. ILS 26 left. 
which right now is two five left because it's been renumbered. Recent. That one has a published minimum of five, 350 feet barometric. Okay. So you want to enter 350 into the MDA line there. Or you mean the decision height. Not the MDA, right? For an ILS? Cause isn't the no, MDA. 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 Oh. I thought that was for... Uh, MDA and DH. So what are the differences? And I see all, and We I talked see about this before, but I thought the MDA was more... Or the DH was more relevant for the ILS approaches, and the MDA was more relevant um, for the RNAV. No. Uh, it has to do with approach categories. Um, not specifically the ILS that part of it, but the approach category. ILSs can come in three flavors, as you know. Come in Cat 1, Cat 2, and Cat 3. All of those are... Um, the only differences between them, and from a from a sort of planning point of view, is that um, a higher category ILS is sort of considered more accurate and reliable, and therefore allows you to approach closer to the runway before you need to either commit to a landing or make a landing decision, or uh, perhaps even continue manually. So a Cat One ILS in most places around the world is classified as having an approach minimum of no less than 200 feet above threshold elevation. Uh, so therefore, by the time your airplane has reached, if you are centered on the glide slope and you're following the localizer guidance down, so you're basically centered track, uh, the moment you hit 200 feet above field elevation, whatever that altitude may be, is when you have to make a decision to either, you, you basically have to have the runway environment in sight. You have to be able to make either a decision to land or a decision, decision to go around. And in the ILS Cat 1 category, I'm sorry, in the Cat 1 uh, approach category and other special parties, you cannot perform a fully automated landing because the equipment on the ground is not certified to that high level of reliability. Cat 2 and Cat 3 approaches are sort of like that, except they are, they provide higher levels of accuracy and redundancy, such that, and sort of fault, de fault detection. So for instance, if the ILS uh, transmitter, many people don't think about it, but if the ILS transmitter on the runway has a fault, the category specification tells you in what time, in how many seconds, the ILS transmitter uh, has to be able to detect that fault and either correct for it by switching off the defective transmitter or doing basically some sort of corrective action. Hmm. Now, uh, the, for Category 3 approaches, the requirements are even more stringent and even more strict in terms of both redundancies, accuracy, and fault tolerance. Uh, the effect essentially being that c Category 3 approaches give you extremely low minimums. A Cat 3 approach will give you between 50 feet above uh, threshold elevation all the way down to almost zero, essentially zero feet uh, decision height, where the airplane, obviously, at that point, you're talking about an automatic landing. You are not able to respond quickly enough to do a go around if you have, like, if you're not able to see the runway if you're 10 feet off the ground. Mm. Um, the difference for you in terms of practical flying on the pilot side is how the minimum point is defined. On a category one approach, the minimum is defined as height above threshold elevation. Meaning, if you draw sort of a virtual line that goes from the threshold, wherever that may be, up to where your plane is right now, if you measured your height above that uh, imaginary line, you would measure 200 feet. That is called a height above threshold elevation. Uh, yeah. Uh, the... Oh, cool. You found a picture for it. Mm. So the problem with ILS Category 1 approach is why you cannot use your radio altimeter to determine that height is because at that point, when you're 200 feet above the ground, you're still so far away from the runway threshold that there is no requirement to make sure that the surface over which you are is the same, same sort of elevation as the runway is. Therefore, you could be essentially over a trench Let's say that you go into something like uh, like Saba, 
in the Caribbean, where the runway essentially ends with a cliff. Mm -hmm. If you measure 200 feet radio altimeter, by the time you measure 200 feet radio altimeter at that point, you're essentially in the side of the mountain. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So therefore, on Cat 1 approaches, rather than using your radio altimeter, the requirement is to use a barometric minimum. So the airport authorities will say, okay, we know that the threshold here is at 150 feet, and we know that you have to be at minimums 200 feet above threshold elevation. Therefore, you set your minimum descent altitude, your MDA, or rather your decision altitude, but that's kind of you know, not getting into some technical detail. Uh, you set your minimum descent, your MDA line, in, to 150 plus 200, 350 feet. So that, so that means when your barometric altimeter shows 350 feet above mean sea level, that means that you are 200 feet above threshold elevation, regardless of the shape of the terrain underneath your aircraft at that okay. point. Make sense? Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to Cat watch or listen to this over and over again to grab every little sure. bit of it, but good stuff. The only difference is with CAT 2 and CAT 3, the requirement for a CAT 2 and CAT 3 certification is that your radio altimeter at that point has to be accurate. So basically the airport authorities have to level the ground in front of the runway such that when your radio altimeter shows either 100 or 50 or whatever value of feet for the minimum, then you know that you are at the very same height above threshold elevation. That's when you use the DH line, the decision height, because okay. at that point you're using the radio altimeter. You're close enough to the runway such that they have leveled out the ground in front of the runway that your radio altimeter is going to be reliable. Okay. And that's Hello? really all that is there is to it. Hello, the dirts. Micebusters learning a lot from you, for sure. We all are. The dirts, good evening. Uh, let's see. What's the option for cargo and passengers? Uh, that's a good question. Maybe someone can answer that. Right now, the only option is on the 320. Now he's talking about the F. He's uh, talking about the DO228 on FS Economy. Oh, I got you. I know. I, I would that one. say I would say the Beechcraft B1900D and make sure you rent mine. <laughs> All right, I need to set a lower altitude. I kind of simulated an ATC. Can you give me the uh, initial approach fix altitude for, or give me like a Certainly. good. Point on the ILS two six. Uh, what uh, do you say, right? Zanim. So X A. X Ray Alpha November India Mike. If you can see that waypoint, if you want to go direct to the final. I'm just direct. looking for a good altitude. A good okay. altitude would be three thousand, or okay. four thousand. Let's say four thousand. All right. Okay, four thousand. And then, yeah. More drag. It happens if you have either if you're given a shortcut, initiated a late descent, or if you have a steep segment in the descent. Or another possibility is if you have if you didn't enter accurate winds into the descent phase, uh, then the airplane might arrive over energy. If you have especially winds are flying. Uh, if, if you've got wind, tailwind, then it'll basically move you. It'll try to blow you closer to the descent, basically mm -hmm. above the profile to try to keep you above the profile. Okay. So that's why. In my case, it was uh, late descent, or I stayed yeah. at a, at a altitude too long. Yeah, that's a possibility as well. I mean, it's not a problem. That's what the speed break is for, after all, right? Yeah. The flying kid was asking about TCAS standby, and uh, 
uh, and not having ADIRSS aligned. Uh, the there's currently a problem in the FF320 that I want to have resolved soon. Um, it's really just a minor thing. Uh, it's really just a minor configuration problem. Where normally TCAS it, TCAS will operate even with no IRSs aligned at all. Um, it's a little bit of an early time to do an approach mode transition, but whatever. Uh, you don't want to be turning on the approach phase just now, but you're in, in it already. Don't worry about it. I'd manually select the speed right now because it's going to try to decelerate you down to the green dot speed. Pretty, pretty. Okay. What speed should I go into? Uh, I'd go to 250 knots. Okay. At least. Because it'll try to go 210 knots or whatever, and that'll uh, just make you... Uh, <laughs> that, that'll make the flight a very long one the, for the approach. Okay. Um... So about TCAS and ADIRSS. Uh, TCAS is actually not dependent on ADIRSS at all. Um, that is currently a, a, a slight bug in the implementation of the ND. Uh, ADIR, uh, TCAS is based completely on... Uh, uh, TCAS is based completely uh, on relative bearings and relative altitudes. And those will be fully functional provided you have... Um, uh, ADR values, so you provided you have the air data. Uh, you don't have to have the IRS position. Uh, if you don't have ADR data, TCAS is still able to determine relative motion, but it will not be able to determine relative altitude. So it might be able, as you said, it might be able to give you TAs or traffic advisories, but it won't be able to give you an actual resolution because it doesn't know the vertical relationships of the airplanes that it sees. It doesn't mm -hmm. really know its own altitude. The way, that's the way TCAS works. It it looks at mode S squitter messages and it looks at mode C active transponder returns from non-mode S targets. And it reads the altitude value field from there and compares it with its own, with its own altitude. And the air data computer in the airplane has to have some sort of a value for its own altitude in order to be able to determine how high or low the target is relative to where we are. Currently, that is a little bit of a limitation. I'm aware of it, and I need to fix it, basically. Fisherman with beard, yes. Toto Ritko is a, uh, a licensed pilot. Yeah, I'm not a commercial pilot, though. I, I'm, I'll be the first guy to admit it. I don't want to give anybody the impression that I'm some sort of commercial, super-duper, highly Dang it, trained... I was selling you as like a current A320 captain. I was selling you I as that. I wouldn't want to lie to anybody. So I'm, <laughs> I'm just a weekend warrior who is really hardcore into systems and physics programming and likes to get himself tied up in knots around studying technical manuals. <laughs> he also gets very angry with uh, online air traffic controllers at times. But we don't oh, hold hopefully. it against him. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Kidding. Let for 10, does it work on X-Plane alone? I don't know. It'd be cool if it did. It's a really sweet plane. All right, what's my altitude supposed to be at native? Let's Let look. Let me check the charts. What's your, which, what's your arrival? Uh, it's the... Um, also, if you want to know, by the way, what the FMGS thinks that you should be at... It's on a the CUDA uh, 4V... DM bird, I would hope so that I know oh, a yeah, little bit good. more about specific parts of the A320 than pilots, because pilots, they have to use the thing, that they, but they don't have to actually implement the thing. They don't have to know all the mar edge conditions about the various algorithms that are going on underneath the hood. So, I don't certainly know more in every aspect, but at least a few I probably know more than uh, a real A320 pilot. I mean, but isn't that the same for all of us, you know? There's always going to be something that you know, but that somebody else doesn't. So that's really not much of a <laughs> not much of a boast anyway. I wish I had I should bring I should have brought my navigraph up and with my geo referencing, um, but I don't have it up right now. Um by the way, so if you want to look at your vertical deviation from the path that you are at right now on the PFD you'll see on the altitude tape there's a little magenta circle. Mm -hmm. Right now it's centered. Okay. That's your FMGS produced vertical path. So right now you are perfectly on path 
no need to do anything. Um, if you want to do, if you if you also want to see, uh, if you also want to see the vertical deviation uh, in terms of like a number, because when the magenta thing is off the scale there, it's basically more than about 500 feet above or below you. You can see that on the MCDU, if you bring up the prog page, it'll say VDEV. There's going to be a VDEV line, and it's going to say plus or minus what, however many feet above or below the profile that you are. So you can also use that. Zero feet, okay. Well, there you go. You're right on the money. So right now, you're pretty good. Of course, you should always uh, do your calculations also in your head manually to check if the computer is not doing something stupid. Mm. Uh, Drew, I was I was running PB6 until about what an hour ago, or less, and then I reverted back to to five, which is much friendlier with this plane as far as frame rates. I will say this: that apparently in public beta seven or eight, a uh, bug that I worked with Laminar with will be uh, rectified. Woohoo! based on something that happened in this plane and a particular crash and uh, the Flight Factor team was referring me to this well this guy Sydney from Laminar reached out to me and we talked about the situation and I gave him some logs and some trace files etc and, and uh, yeah he found uh, uh, there's some GNS 430 tie-ins to this plane that do not need to be present Let's put it that way. That could cause a particular uh, a crash. That's supposed to be fixed in seven or eight, I think. Essentially, what it was is I want I mapped a GNS four thirty uh, a, a binding on my joystick where I could change the cursor and the f and the letter with using a a slider on my joystick. Right. Well, when I was using that slider on my joystick accidentally it then I had a I had a crash with the plane so yeah they're they're gonna make it so the GNS 430 is not I guess you can't access that which because we know it doesn't exist in this plane it's so awesome though that our sim gets updated so regularly And we don't have to pay a ton of money for it. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, 200 knots now. Should I? Let's see. I'm about to make a turn up here. It looks like. What arrival are you on right now? If the, I may ask. A Cude Four V. Okay, a Cude Four Victor. Let me see. I got Baytel for Victor. Hopefully that's yeah, my that hold. There's an Akuti 5 Victor, so it's probably that one that's yeah. probably just been <laughs> updated. So uh, you're approaching which point? Akuti right now? Uh, no, DT 439. I'm over. Ah, all right, I see. Uh, so you're in the approach transition at this point. I'm actually, it looks like I'm going to do a left downwind. Yeah. So I can stay at 200. That's fine. And I'm about to turn left sure. downwind. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can take a shortcut if you want to after mm -hmm. a little bit, after you sort of level out on the downwind. Would it be okay uh, to put in flaps one here or no? Uh, you can, it, it'll try to slow you down, but there's quite a ways to go if you're going to be going out out there. So right now I wouldn't be doing it just yet. I'm to just, be honest, I wouldn't, even, I, I wouldn't have even activated the approach phase. And uh, you, you shouldn't, by the way, normally when you want to slow down on the approach phase, you would just set manage speed. Because right now it's your 200 knots, which is 10 knots below your green dot. A green dot is your point of maximum lift to drag, so that's where the airplane is most efficient. So normally I just push in the speed selector, okay. uh, l let the airplane speed up on its own, um, and it'll go to the optimum uh, performance value there. 
and probably you know you could after let's say uh as you approach DT-454, I'd probably just turn around, do a 180 to the left, and turn on to final. You're close enough that you don't have to go that very long sort of downwind. This is really mostly meant for sequencing reasons. That gives uh, ATC space to organize their traffic. Mm. But when you're flying alone, you don't really have to do these like super duper long downwinds. I like the ortho, though, so I may just go out. Sure. If you want to, uh, have fun. It's always good. I was just thinking that I might put in a notch of flaps just because of that nose up attitude, but I guess that's normal. No, no, that's that's, that's fine. You leave the the attitude as is. The airplane is happy this way. Um, uh, normally, you'd really even be flying a little bit faster. You're probably about 220, 230, uh, but don't worry about that right now. Uh, uh, and yeah, you're below transition level. Um, and you probably want to, you know, start uh, dialing in your barrel of pressure on the altimeter. You might even go a little bit lower. Let's see. Are you really... So you went to Echo Delta Delta Bravo, right? Because I'm probably looking at the wrong no, chart tango. or something. Okay, so that's why my runways didn't, like, it seemed like a completely wrong approach. <laughs> there we go. Now it's starting to make sense. Alice, two, so 2-6 two left. They're working, Laminar's working on a uh, 2-6 rate. They're working on with okay. kids in elementary school where they have them design a plane and fly it. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. So you want to be at 3,000 at the Rogab, Rogab point. That's the uh, light slope intercept point. 9.7 miles, uh, 9.7 DME from the uh, Tegel VOR. So if you, I'd say if you turn around now, you'd be perfectly good. Right now, the airplane is doing a very shallow descent because it, it's following a very shallow profile. So feel free to turn around to the left if you want to take a shortcut. Uh, like a manual turn? Or yeah, go sure. direct you, to you, a waypoint? You, uh, you can do both. You can first sort of pull on the heading knob, uh, spin it over to the left, or you, you can you can spin it and then pull. Uh, either way you prefer to set up set yourself up like for uh, say a 30 to 40 degree intercept onto the final course or I'll just let it fly it you can do that but you know if, uh, it's really up to you if you want to create a monkey around with the airplane that's perfectly good all right so res let's see what would be a good if I wanted to do an intercept what would be a good heading to, to set uh, a good intercept heading would probably be about uh, let's say 290 to 300 Oops. Okay, turning to three zero zero. And then if you go into the MCDU, if you go to the rect two page, yeah, you find the you find a point named Rogab, Romeo yep. Oscar Golf Alpha Bravo. Yep. And then, rather than just going direct, select radial in on the right-hand lower side. So it'd be LSK right 5, I think, or something like that. Um, after I select Rogab. Yep, after you select Rogab. And then, we did this before, I remember this. this is, I love this. It'll give you an automatic intercept. And then I'm doing a radial in of 079. Yes, exactly. And then direct and that'll to? make you intercept the inbound course nicely rather than going just direct to the waypoint it'll intercept the point it'll intercept the original course using whatever heading you had in before that so radial in you want to select that and it'll compute a nice intercept point on the nd before you click insert should i click it direct to insert uh you want to uh, i don't know if you've clicked uh, the radial in point it has to light up oh oh yeah there we go Okay. And then you can hit insert. 
Yep, it drew the intercept. Cool. I forgot about that. Making it bigger. Makes sense. Okay, and then you can select 3,000 on the glare shield. Uh, you can use vertical speed or just open descent and start setting up for the approach. So once you're inbound, you're qu still quite a way away uh, from the descent point, so no need to go crazy on the flaps yet. Uh, but you can sort of start thinking about the sort of approach strategy that you want to have. Uh, okay, so 3,000. I can arm you the select. approach button now, huh? Um, yes, you could. I mean, you're already receiving the localizer signal. Yeah. So I could do so I could do loc. I'll do loc. Sure. And there it should go. probably almost immediately capture. Yeah. And, uh, okay. I'll do approach mode. And you can bring up on the on the ND. You can, you see the sort of magenta. I'm sorry, the cyan uh, arrow pointing at a portion of your path. That's where you will le reach 3,000 feet. So feel free to adjust your vertical speed accordingly. Right now you're in managed descent desk because you pushed the button in. You yeah. didn't use virtual yeah. vertical speed. Yeah. But that's fine. Uh, if you level off uh, a little bit ahead of Rogab. Then you can start rolling flaps maybe, oh, three or five miles ahead of Rogab is perfectly sufficient. Okay. What are the rings? These are uh, two and a half mile rings? Uh, the, the little yeah. lines that are arranged in a ring around you. Yeah, that's two and a half miles. Then you've got a five and a seven and a half mile ring. Okay. And by the time you start your descent, you want to be basically flaps to and select gear down. Uh, normally, you would keep the speed up a little bit. So after selecting flaps to, you can go manual. So you, you can select uh, selected speed and go to like, uh, I don't know, 180 to, 160 to 180 until you're a little bit closer to the airport. Then but you the would, managed speed will handle that, right? No, managed speed will go down to the F speed for flaps to, which is about 140. That'll make you fairly slow. Mm. Um, so the go airplane manual route, speed now, do you think? Um, n when you start your descent, normally is when you would uh, sort of be thinking about that. So once you select flaps 2, the airplane will try and slow down to the F speed that is displayed on the primary flight display. Now, it's going to be very low. F speeds are pretty slow. All right, two and a half from um, Rogab. I'm going to put in a notch of flaps. Yes. Right. And you are... Okay, and you got your glide slope mode armed. That's fantastic. I've never landed at Berlin in the sim ever. <laughs> well, there's always a first time for everything. Yeah. All right, it's coming down. We're about to go down. So uh, you're saying go down to like 165, 170? Yeah, that's usually 160 is pretty good. So flaps to gear down, uh, manually select 160. And then stay in stay in speed managed mode? Uh, no, pull. I, I, pull, so yeah, I mean, speed. Yeah, I mean, it's managed, but I manage the speed all the way down? Uh, no, normally, so after you are ready to fi do final configuration for approach, you can use, you just push in the speed and it'll automatically decelerate to the approach speed as you select the flaps higher and higher. Okay. So I normally uh, maintain 160 until about four miles out. Okay. And then uh, when you are ready to start the final configuration, so passing about four miles from the runway, you would go... Uh, push in the speed, the airplane will back off on the power, slow down, and start slowing down to the flaps speeds, and then you just select flaps 3, and after a little bit, flaps full. Uh, make sure, by the way, if you started your descent, that you've got your go-around altitude set, which uh, is, uh, let's see, 4,000. Uh, yeah, and once you have your flaps full, you can do your uh, landing checklists, and basically setting yourself up for manual flight if you plan on doing a manual landing. So 
So I'd say you're getting pretty close to four miles, so just push the speed in. Outer marker? Yeah, outer marker is usually some defined point for uh, the descent. Just okay, feel flaps. free to push the speed and, are full. Yep, and advance low. Three and a half hours. Cool. And by a thousand feet, you will be fully stabilized at this point uh, with flaps full uh, at the approach, reference speed, and uh, fully right. configured. You can start thinking about either taking manual control whenever you feel like it, or I'll take you know, it doing at, all certain. Yeah, I'll take it at one out. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I still haven't got that flare right, but you guys can. I get. I think landing rate plugin is working right now, but let's go. Feel free to take a guess. I would go above three hundred if I were you, because I haven't got. It's just a different flare than the Zebo. Approaching two six right. And if you don't feel comfortable with the throttles yet, feel free to just leave the auto, thr auto throttle in. To disconnect the auto But with the auto throttle the on, I still need to go idle, right, though, when it says yes. retard? Yeah. When it, when it says retard, just pull them idle. All right. And you can use the disconnection button on the side stick, which is the proper way, so just click it yeah, twice. Yeah, I have a button that I'm just going to disengage right now. I hate that. Okay, there we go. Yep. My airplane... Oh, the slope's getting below me. Minimum two hundred. One hundred. Fifty, forty, thirty, twenty. Retard. Retard. Retard five. It's gonna be a softy, but but it uh, was long. I guess I don't have landing rate plug in right now. <laughs> it was long. It was float. No landing rate. Hot brakes, brake fan coming on. You don't have to deploy the brake fan yet. One thing I noticed in the real world is they do not bring up those flaps until they're way off the. Uh, do I want to? Oh, yeah, it's wanna usually as part of the cleanup procedure for the airplane, and it's really airline policy dependent. Yeah. But the point is. Oops, grass. No. Stay off the grass. <laughs> Oh, there's another runway. We've been told to taxi on the runway. We're fine. Zero, eight, right. That was good. I'm going to have to review that whole landing with you because that was some really good information. And the next time when I'm landing and you're not available but you're watching runway, it, two, you're going to be six, saying, left, two, No, seven, you don't do that. You, I taught you better than that. And I'll be like, You're right. I'll go <laughs> watch the video again. I don't worry about it. As long as you're having fun, that's really important. That's, that's I have only. so much fun. Uh, and Airbus, way, go ahead. No, no, worry, don't worry. Go ahead. I was no, saying, Svero said, uh, you was the Airbus that just flew over my house. That's right, Svero. <laughs> Why didn't it fade? What do you mean? Teacher is to be judged by the results of his student. <laughs> oh, my. Well, I've definitely improved, but it, there is a, there's something to be said about repetition is is the key to to uh, memorization in my mind. Yep, just tra practice, practice. Yeah, and and um, don't get too distracted by general aviation aircraft that are so fun to fly. The marker sound. Why didn't it fade? It did fade, I think. I mean, it does fade for me, but I'm not sure. Uh, I didn't. I'm, I'm not listening to the stream in real time, so because I'd have like two John fl John flies in my head, and that that gets that would be confused. too much. <laughs> That'd be a little bit too much John fly for me. Mm -hmm. But I will listen to it again. The flying kid. Normally the markers do fade, but they fade in a rather rapid fashion. So they'll fade up to sort of almost maximum intensity in about a second, and then re fade down again. Uh, 
Okay, I'll, I'll check in the stream, but normally it does happen in the airplane, so I don't know. Uh, X-Plane does not... X-Plane itself, so these markers, the, the marker sound here is not from X-Plane, it is from the FF320, but um, I'm gonna check if uh, there was no fade. Normally there should be a little bit. Um, the intensity of the voice, of the noise of the marker fade is really... Um, Uh, you'd have to tell me which marker. Was it the inner marker or the outer marker? Um, the middle marker. Uh, the outer marker, I did listen to that one. Uh, sounded for a little bit, but you know, it was clearly audible. Um, are you talking about the in inner marker? Middle marker. Hmm. I'm going to have to listen to that. That, that, I, that one I didn't hear. Um, All right, let's do a replay. Parking job was not too great, John. Mm -mm. I won't disagree. Mm. Anyway, you don't. You, by the way, the, the brake fan there. Well, there's still a bunch of fixes that need to be done to the brake temperature model. That is a known issue. The brakes are heating up right now way too quickly. Uh, there's a lacking simulation of the heat transfer into the uh, brake temperature sensor. So normally, if you were to have hot brakes on landing, they would the warning would come later. That would, it would come like a couple of minutes after landing. And uh, I've read, I don't know if I've sent you that, but I've read a paper um, on carbon brake fade or com carbon brake wear. And the recommendation there is not to turn on the uh, brake fan after a landing if you have hot brakes because the brakes themselves actually do not like being at an intermediate temperature they like being either very very cold or very hot mm. but they don't want to be taxied around uh, yeah, a little bit too much flare yeah uh, but they do not like uh, being taxied around at about uh, between 100 to 200 degrees celsius which is what we would get if you if you'd had like the brake fan on so normally the, the recommendation is either taxi out at under 100 degrees and taxi in at over 250 degrees approximately, the, the actual disk temperature. But as I said, there's going to be a bunch of fixes that are going to be done to the brake model. Uh, right now, there's a little bit on the back burner, and we're focusing mainly on bugs. On Steve the sort says, of big John, uh, quit getting on yourself. You're doing fine with every new plane. It takes, it takes me almost a month just to have the a flight where I can take off and land. Hey, thanks, uh, Steve. I appreciate that. Yeah, I am pretty hard on myself. I, I Yeah, I, I agree. You're doing great, John. I think Don't I'm, worry, a, really. I'm making, I'm making progress, especially with Airbus being a Boeing, a Boeing lad. Let's do a runway view. Um, how much ortho have I got installed? I've got four, 11, tw 12 terabytes of ortho installed oh, on my PC. That's a lot of ortho. <laughs> yep. And it's still not the whole world, so mm -mm. it's a never-ending finish line. We got to have a dude salute and a dude pass on that landing. All right, let's see what the tower saw. Here we got Val, Val dudes. Spamming us a little bit. Yep, Val Dudes is in the house, baby. Val Dudes is going to love this plane. Yeah, I pulled up too much there. That would have been good if I had just not kind of pulled up too much. And then I wing flex check. <laughs> Well, that was cool. I think it's time to go on pilot edge. <clears throat> so I'm probably just going to answer Mr. T. Chow in voice here since I'm here. Faster than typing out a response. Uh, Please, it probably yeah. should have... It probably should have said that checklist with the 150 degrees C on the brakes 
should have said less than 150 degrees C. But um, Airbus does not have any specific hard rule about brake temperatures. It does have some recommendations. And the recommendation normally is brake temperature below 150 degrees. Uh, mm, well, I mean, it doesn't say 150 degrees. Normally, they recommend not to taxi out with the hot brakes uh, light on. Uh, but I am going to I am going to find uh, uh, I am going to find that paper for you. It's an interesting read. Uh, and it is a recommendation from Airbus on how to operate carbon brakes. And you'll see that in that paper, there's a lot of graphs there, uh, especially like I think graph around, around page seven. There's a composite graph, uh, it's p page six, where you have different brake wear estimated by different brake manufacturers. So it really depends on which brakes you're using on your airplanes, what your airline SOP is, what your certification is, and all of that stuff. So. Um, do take what I say here about the brake temperatures as just a sort of general guidance of what would be probably a good source, a, a good starting point for how to construct an actual airline um, airline recommendation. But with the actual airline operations are a fairly complicated process internally for the airlines to determine mm -hmm. what goes in a checklist and what sort of operation limits they have. Iowa Scotsman did his first ILS landing correctly, so it's all about progress this, mor this morning. Thank you. That's awesome, Iowa. Congratulations. I'm glad that uh, you got the bird down. It's good. I don't know when the second round of betas come out. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Flossie said, uh, C206 Station Air says, nice flight. Thanks. Uh, no, we're not doing Memphis to Pittsburgh. <laughs> Cage has got to mention one of his new airports at least once a stream. <laughs> I'm an XP uh, Flossie says I'm an XP newbie can you put your ortho tiles in another location to keep your X folder yes you can uh, so for example Flossie t uh, pay attention here on my uh, on my um, on my X plane European folder if you go into custom scenery you'll see some airports here actually I don't know why Las Vegas is in Europe but uh, you'll can see here all of these airports these are all shortcuts to where they actually reside. And then all of these ortho, they're all just shortcuts. So I, I, I uh, everything 48, 48th parallel and lower, uh, ortho 4XP is stored on my uh, D drive, on a separate hard drive. And all I did is I created a shortcut, and then I cut and pasted that shortcut into my custom scenery folder here for Europe. So, yeah. And then there's also a way to do it where, uh, for example, in my North America, custom scenery folder itself is a symbolic link. Uh, symbolic link is a whole other discussion, but basically I've made it so my custom f scenery folder itself just links to another folder uh, on, my, uh, on a different hard drive. So, And then even inside there, I have shortcuts sometimes. I've got mostly ortho. In this one, I have actually right. I have it all ortho. So yeah. So you're using Simlinks as well. I thought I was yep. the only guy. Yeah, Simlinks are awesome. Finally, Windows got them in like Windows Seven. Yeah, yeah. It took a while. Finally, copied something from Unix that. Well, they should have like thirty years ago. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna close down Europe. See you, Europe. That was cool. My first Berlin approach and landing with a bad flare, but hey, we learned something there. You bet, Flossie. <laughs>